Uh, yeah, so I'm Mavona, and today I'd like to share a little bit about my first PhD project, examining the human claustrum uh, with the help of Big Brain. So the claustrum gives us some clue about its nature, or perhaps a warning via its name. <laughs> Is that better? Thank you. Uh, which translates to something like hidden place. Uh, it's a subcortical gray matter structure. I show it here in red. And it's wrapped really tightly by white matter of the extreme and the external capsules. Um, uh, and it's between the gray matter of the putamen and the insula, which are shown in gray. So structurally, the claustrum is noted for having an incredibly complex shape. In short order, it trans, uh, transformed from concave to uh, convex. And it's also very thin. So at points, it's just micrometers wide. Uh, we know an increasing amount about the claustrum's connectivity. Um, it's often said to be the most highly connected structure in the brain by volume, and it appears to have reciprocal connections across the entire cortical mantle. So as you might expect, its uh, remarkable connectivity has given rise to many hypotheses about its function. Um, it's been posited as something like a switchboard operator or a conductor of the brain's orchestra. And famously, Francis Crick in his last, and I think posthumously published paper, speculated that the claustrum might be the seat of human consciousness. Uh, but despite all of this excitement, uh, relatively little is known about the claustrum empirically, um, uh, both functionally and anatomically. And compared to other nuclei, it's very understudied, especially in humans. And I think that the reason for this is twofold. Uh, the first is that uh, naturalistic lesions here are very rare, especially bilaterally. Uh, and also it's very hard to capture in vivo uh, with uh, conventional MRI. So the problem with capturing the claustrum in vivo, of course, is fund fundamentally about resolution. Uh, typical MRI resolution would seem to be too coarse. So in the slide on uh, up here, I'm showing how the claustrum is captured uh, at one millimeter uh, at three T on the left and 0.7 millimeters at seven T on the right. So as a consequence of this suboptimal resolution of MR, I think it's the case that a lot of investigations in MRI fail to capture at least some portions of the claustrum. Uh, in some cases, I think that's what's captured has been affected by partial volume effects that um, capture the surround, surrounding white matter tracks. And though we haven't done any kind of systematic review, some of the pioneering studies that we reviewed uh, um, also seem to capture actually parts of the putamen and the insula and in what they're calling the colostrum. And this is because capturing the colostrum is actually really hard. Um, it's not included in any standard atlases that I know of. Uh, and as a result, these papers are all limited by the fact that um, none of the colostral coverage is compared to a clear reference or a gold standard. So this is uh, what our work pertains to. Our first aim was to use the big brain to illuminate what the colostrum really looks like to create a so-called gold standard. Uh, as I sort of alluded, we searched for such a reference for our own work and we couldn't find one. Uh, and our second aim was to use the big brain derived standard to get a sense of how well the claustrum could be captured in vivo via MRI. Uh, so my first step uh, was to segment the claustrum on the 100 micron big brain template in MNI space. And I ended up doing this work manually in ITK SNAP software. So this was, as you might sympathize, really time intensive, but we, we thought it was necessary. Uh, we did start off trying to use some semi-automated tools, including those in ITK SNAP. And for those that are familiar with the software, we found that the methods including uh, classification, clustering, and edge attraction simultaneously included too little and too much. Uh, we also found that the clustering varied enough between slices so that we couldn't even really do a simple interpolation between every other slice. So uh, for this manual segmentation, I was guided by the expectation of what the claustrum ought to look like, informed by histological literature, both in humans and other animals. Uh, but to segment, I relied primarily on the visible MR contrast. And I segmented simultaneously in all three planes. And in cases of ambiguity, I opted to be quite liberal. Uh, and I intended to include both the dorsal and the ventral claustrum, as these structures are continuous in humans. And for our first pass, the only exclusion criteria that we implemented was that in cases of ambiguity, we would exclude voxels that um, appear to be non-contiguous in at least uh, one of the planes with the larger segmentation. <coughs> so here's some snapshots of the resulting volume. 
It looks a little bit better if it's smaller. I'm noticing some uh, problems with, the, <laughs> with this size. Uh, but uh, here it is rotating counterclockwise from the left to the right. So when we reviewed this volume, we had two thoughts. The first was that uh, clearly this underscores the claustrum's unusual structure, I think. Uh, we see it's a very thin sheet uh, that takes both convex and concave shape, as mentioned, and it's quite diffuse, and it matches quite nicely with the histolo histological descriptions we, we read about. Uh, secondly, and crucially, the claustrum was much bigger than we expected based on our first exposure to it in MRI studies, um, which is you know, the domain that we're coming from. So a bit more quantitatively, we found that the big brain's claustrum extent was roughly 50 millimeters in its top down and also back to front directions. And our segmentation had a volume of uh, 1300 millimeters cubed in a surface area about, of about 4,000 millimeters squared. So to put this in perspective, this makes the claustrum surface area about 67% larger than that of V1. And again, I'm mentioning this just to underscore how surprised we were by this, given the existing MR literature, which has typically drawn the claustrum at a really small number of voxels. Uh, so after this basic characterization of the big brain's claustral structure, we were interested to know if our segmentation might reveal anything about the hypothesized or maybe established subcomponents. So way of, uh, uh, by way of quick background, typically the claustrum is thought to be uh, divided into a dorsal and a ventral part. And these structures are defined most clearly, I think, on the basis of their connectivity. So the image here shows these two components as discerned, as discerned by their fiber orientation from a direction included T1 from another group. Uh, but if these subcomponents have a distinct morphology in terms of their cell bodies or their cell density remains debated. So our first effort to see if we could discern these subcomponents is pretty basic. Uh, we wanted to see if we could do so on the basis of contrast alone. So we just performed a basic uh, intensity analysis as MR intensity is a rough proxy for cell density. Uh, so here we're showing the normalized intensity values uh, with a Laplacian filter. Mm -hmm. Um, and we do see varying intensity across the claustrum's extent. Uh, almost invariably, I think the highest intensity, which is indicated in this picture in red, is in the claustrum's medial sections. Um, not surprisingly, these are the areas that appear to be consonant with the areas of the claustrum that are best captured by MRI. Uh, but it's not yet clear to us if these clusters are consistent with any sort of ventral or dorsal division or some other proposed division, which is a question that we will hopefully soon um, examine more carefully. So we then turn to our second objective to determine how well the claustrum can be captured at 7T. And for this task, we used a small data set of uh, N equals six from Maastricht University. So we segmented on an MP2 range, which is a bias field free T1 weighted image and allows for a pretty excellent gray white matter distinction. And crucially, I performed the segmentation in exactly the same way as I did for Big Brain. Uh, so it was manual, I used the same software, and again, I focused mostly on the contrast. Um, and to ensure that we could see maximal intersubject variability here, I did segment in native space. And what I'm showing on the screen is the segmentation for one of the participants who happens to be the most representative of the group of six. So we observed some variability here. Uh, on, in this image, uh, the red indicates voxels that are included um, in just one individual, whereas the yellow indicates they're included in all. And crucially, we saw the highest agreement in the core of the segmentation, also in its larger parts, and also nearing its ventral interior point. Uh, okay. So here's a visualization of the analysis that we were ultimately most interested in which is comparing the big brain reference segmentation to the 7T data. So this image is showing just one participant at 7T and the green indicates if the voxel was evident just in the big brain, red is just for the MR participant and blue is the overlap. And we expected to see mostly green, meaning mostly visible in big brain, which is indeed the case, especially in the claustrum's ventral part. We actually expected to see much more blue or overlap. We see surprisingly little. Um, on the other hand, we see a little bit more red than we expected, which is um, aspects of the claustrum just visible in the MR participant. But we think of course that the reason for this is that the claustrum is quite variable between individuals uh, as we showed on the, on the prior slide. 
So here's the same comparison of big brain to our 7T data, but this time summarizing information across all of those six participants. So as you can see, all four of these metrics are smaller in the 7T data than they are in big brain. And most compellingly, I think that the MRI captures only about 50% of the big brain's extent from top to bottom. Uh, and also the MR segmentation surface area is only about 21% that of big brain. Uh, so, you know, in quick summary, I think that these results clearly endorse our, our suspicion that the claustrum is illuminated by big brain is much bigger than that. That was discernible to us uh, from MRI. So coming from our background in MRI, we expected the claustrum was very small and compact, but our segmentation from big brain revealed that it's much larger and much more diffuse, perhaps as histologists of course have long known. Uh, and we were surprised nonetheless that even a small resolution of 0.7 millimeters at 7T was really unable to capture the claustrum's extent, surface area, and its volume. So certainly this emphasized to us the importance of using data sets like big brain to establish a grand truth reference before diving into our research with MR. So we're really excited by these preliminary results and we hope ultimately that we can find a way forward with our in vivo imaging plans uh, with a better idea of what is lost. So in terms of the MRI, our next steps that we hope to complete will be to test and compare some of these emerging automated segmentations via deep learning. We also of course wanna compare a segmentation that we perform on T1 maps and perhaps other contrasts. And we also want to compare segmentations at higher resolution in vivo. Uh, these last two steps in particular are going to be quite important for us to understand if it's the contrast mechanism or the resolution that's the most important for capturing the colostrum, which might allow us to design you know, better studies capitalizing on one but not the other. Uh, so if you have data sets we could use, we'd love to hear. I'm from Toronto, as mentioned, and we don't let, yet have a 7T, so I'm sort of dependent on using other people's data. Uh, and our last point is that um, after a validation, of course, we hope to make this segmentation publicly available. Uh, we hope it could inform some anatomical reference atlases in which, as mentioned, the claustrum is rarely included. Uh, doing so, we hope would move both our work and others forward and be better situated to ask these really exciting questions that maybe are a little bit premature in terms of claustral function in humans. Okay, thanks so much. <laughs>